Firefox, based on a novel of the same title by Craig Thomas and made into a film by Clint Eastwood, which he produced, directed, and starred in, is a classic example of the Cold War spy thriller and was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Eastwood plays Mitchell Gant, a Vietnam War fighter pilot with that movie version of PTSD that kicks in as the story requires. He also has a native-level fluency in Russian, which gets him sent undercover into the Soviet Union to steal an advanced to the point of sorcery Soviet fighter prototype, the MiG-31 Firefox. Not to be confused with the MiG-31 Foxhound, which is a real Soviet-era aircraft and not at all super tech. Today, the idea of hyper-advanced Soviet technology is a bit laughable, but there's a long history of politicians, intelligence analysts, defense contractors, and even old Nazi spy masters inflating Soviet capabilities to further their own goals. And so the Firefox is amazing, and the Americans need to get their hands on it. Gant is resistant when presented with the pitch, but they convince him to take on the mission. It's never satisfactorily established how they convince him. I see what you're saying there. Is that you've already picked a volunteer, right? We'll roll with it. He flies into Moscow under a false identity, a guy that the KGB has identified as a heroin smuggler, which seems like it was done just to make it more complex than necessary. Well, don't you see? The man who arrived two days ago is a substitute, covering his tracks with the smuggler's dead body. Some spy movie skullduggery ensues as Gant meets up with his contacts, who have to get him to the base where the Firefox is housed all while the KGB is after them in a typically clumsy and slow bureaucratic Soviet way. Most of the movie is this spy thriller stuff with over-reliance on checkpoints to build tension. Your papers are not in order. It's done competently, if not spectacularly. But where Firefox stands apart is when Gant gets to the airfield and has to steal the plane with the help of the dissident engineers forced by the regime to build it. The inspiration for the secret Soviet wonder jet was the MiG-25 Foxbat, an interceptor introduced in the late 60s as an answer to the American SR-71 and the B-70 Valkyrie, which had been cancelled as a bomber by the time the MiG-25 actually entered service. The MiG-25 set multiple climb and speed records and was for a time looked at by Western analysts as a superfighter capable of flying higher and faster than anything in the NATO arsenal, a Russian miracle jet packed with state-of-the-art technology. Until 1976, when a Soviet pilot, Viktor Belyenko, flew one to Japan. Upon examination of the aircraft, American analysts discovered that it was shockingly crude. The vacuum tube electronics raised eyebrows, the rivets were rough and uneven, the welds looked like the kind of orc work I do in my garage. Where American high-performance aircraft would use titanium, the MiG used heavy nickel steel, and the engines tore themselves apart to achieve their top speed of around Mach 3, give or take. The Soviets were known to have on occasion stripped one down as light as such a beast can get and flew it as fast as it would go when they knew NATO radars were tracking it. The engines had to be replaced, but all NATO analysts saw was this MiG tear-assing across the sky like it did it every day. It was all for show, and some believed the hype. The film's MiG-31 Firefox is everything the MiG-25 wasn't. The fastest, most advanced, best-armed combat aircraft in the world. An invisible radar, too. In the film, the Firefox gives the Soviets an unstoppable interceptor. The British and Americans need to get their hands on it, presumably to counter and or copy its super tech. Or maybe they're hoping it's like the MiG-25, an overhyped one-trick pony. One notable catch is that among the MiG's advanced tech is a fire control system that's operated by thought. Yes, the pilot controls the weapons by thinking about it. Though as depicted in the film, it's more like sub-vocalizing verbal commands. In Russian, of course. You must think in Russian. As implemented, it's slower than just hitting a button with your thumb, but we'll go with it because a Russian jet that can read your mind is some serious Soviet woo-woo, especially considering they could barely build a reliable car. Not entirely fair, but I do not retract it. From a plot standpoint, it reinforces the language requirement and narrows down the candidate pool. So, despite his bouts of incapacitating flashbacks, they need Mitch Gant to do it. They take him to see some Brits, who brief him on going to Russia to steal it from some other Brits dressed up as Russians, and the journey of subterfuge and murder ensues. While Firefox has all the Cold War tropes, KGB agents in trench coats demanding papers, daring escapes, heroic regular guys fighting to throw off the yoke of communism, and of course, evil empire Soviet aesthetics, it steps above these to become a prime example of Cold War cultural mythologizing. 
The enemy in the Cold War wasn't the Russians so much as the idea of the Russians. The actual Soviet Union was dangerous and militarily powerful, but it was also kind of a mess. For all the hype of a missile gap, the Red Dawn scenarios, the always imminent Soviet advance through the Fulda Gap, the Soviet leadership was no more insane and bloodthirsty than Western leaders, and much like Premier Andropov and then Premier Chernyenko, their economy was a creaking, teetering mess by the 1980s. We were ready to nuke them into ashes, but we also sent huge shipments of grain over so they wouldn't go hungry. It was a strange, dysfunctional relationship. But it meant that the Soviets got to blame all their problems on capitalist American pigs, and the American military-industrial complex had an excuse to justify huge spending on programs that seemed to become ever more complex and expensive thanks to the pressures of the arms race and American reliance on high-tech weapons to counter the Soviet numerical edge. When the Cold War began, shortly after the end of World War II, the U.S. and Soviet militaries began to diverge in their approach to a potential future conflict. This is grossly oversimplifying things for the sake of not talking for two hours, but basically the Americans focused on better, while the Soviets leaned toward more. More tanks, more fighters, all simpler equipment meant to be operated by less trained, often conscript soldiers. Again, in grossly oversimplified terms, the American M1 is a better tank than the Soviet T-72. But is it better than five T-72s? Does it matter when nukes start flying? Well, maybe it does actually, but that's another topic. As the arms race continued, one side would develop something that flies higher, goes faster, or is harder to detect, and the other would rush to counter it, repeat as needed. It was usually the Soviets rushing to catch up, with a couple notable exceptions. The MiG-25 is a fine example of playing catch-up, developed because they'd gotten quite tired of American SR-71 zipping through their airspace, and the prospect of a supersonic bomber like the B-70 doing it needed to be addressed. And just as this supersonic arms race was about machines more than men, the real star of Firefox is the Firefox itself. In the novel, author Craig Thomas used the MiG-25 as his template. His MiG-31 is just a souped-up better MiG-25, which is pretty much what the actual MiG-31 is. But if you're going to make a movie about this plane, it has to look cool. Like, movie cool. A MiG-25 knockoff won't cut it, especially after Lieutenant Belyenko's jaunt to Hokkaido. So they took some Foxbat, threw in some Blackbird and some Valkyrie, blended it with some speculation on what a stealthy fighter jet might look like, all black and angular, and ended up with a design that kind of set the tone for speculative aircraft design in the 80s. Not just in entertainment, but also sharing a lot with the defense analysts. In the mid-80s, I was an avid reader of Air Force magazine, among other defense trades of the day, and the annual Soviet Aerospace Almanac was always a favorite. The 1985 issue featured a cover story about the MiG-2000, a speculative aircraft as imagined by Richard Ward of General Dynamics, based on scant information about what the Soviets might be working on for a fifth-generation fighter. The illustrations bear some broad similarities, aside from the intake configuration into an actual classified project that the MiG Design Bureau was working on at the time. We also have to mention the fictional MiG-37 model kit that testers put out in the late 80s, going with a faceted, janky airframe to suggest the supposedly more primitive state of Soviet radar-absorbent material as compared to America's then super-secret stealth fighter. That was before the Air Force disclosed this janky, faceted airframe as their long-denied super-secret stealth fighter. While the Firefox was pure fantasy and a much sleeker MiG-31 than the real aircraft, it was in some ways the shape of things to come, tapping into the same currents that were driving real fighter design. We see echoes of its lines in modern fighters like the American F-22, the Chinese J-20, and perhaps the real heir of the Firefox's mythos, the Russian Su-57, all of which share the traits of being cutting edge, really expensive, and unproven in combat. Unless you count launching some missiles into Ukraine and shooting down a balloon. All of which is a reminder that a big part of preparing for war is posturing for adversaries to make your own military seem more imposing than it is, while at the same time making guesses about the real capabilities of those adversaries. We see it just as much today as we did during the Cold War. No one really knows for certain whether their enemy is a formidable superpower or a paper tiger until the fighting starts. Everything else is artifice and posturing. Firefox is a little cultural piece of that process.
At the time, it was just a fun Clint Eastwood movie, but looking at it today, I see Firefox as a cultural artifact preserved for future generations to explore alongside the piles of documents and the piles of hardware that the Cold War left behind. That engine and intake configuration, though, that is not going to do what you wanted to do.